Um, I am going to uh, give you a whirlwind tour of some of my work and opportunities um, across campus. So I teach um, GIS classes and I uh, help run a GIS lab in CNR and mapping is kind of my passion, has been for a long time. So I'll tell you a little bit about some of the projects that I do, um, but this is a very small sample. There's tons of very exciting stuff. So we'll just launch into it. And um, I just wanted to say that this is who I am on the left. I'm professor cooperative extension specialist. I'm interested in GIS and remote sensing and forests and rangelands and woodlands. Things that I really love are drones, historical data, mapping, LIDAR, I'm gonna show you some of those and things that I miss. Since we're all in shutdown, I miss swimming in the pool and I usually do this big race in Hawaii and I miss doing that and I miss traveling. I wasn't able to go to Tokyo like I normally do to see my friends. So um, those are the things that I, I love and I miss. Um, but I always start my classes thinking about this. We're a lot of us involved in CNR um, in resource management, um, natural resource management. And I think all of the activities that we do always start with a map. We always need a map. And these days, a map means geographic information system or some kind of way to store data, analyze data and display data. So for me, mapping means GIS, but it's really a lot more than it used to be even five years ago. So to me, um, a map or a GIS is a combination of data, really, really interesting sources of data from, from sensors, from remote sensing, from GIS, from participatory sources and, and crowd sources from the field, from drones. It's also a collection of tools ways to gather data together, to do really um, interesting 3D or 4D analysis, gorgeous design through cartography, paying attention to web and visualization. All these kinds of tools are, are, um, are, are changing all the time and, and very important in the work that we do. Some of these data and tools are proprietary and some are open. But at the end of the day, they have to make sense to people. We have to think about collaborative projects, projects that engage, projects that make an impact. And so I, um, Isaac will be sick of, of hearing this because he's in my class, but I really think that these kinds of tools that, that um, I teach and I'm passionate about um, help us answer many of the challenges we face today around food, water, energy, invasive species, fire, climate change, all of these things they're complex, they're spatial, and they impact diverse public groups. And so, you know, it's kind of a data science uh, uh, approach to things. They all require finding the right data, pulling together um, these interesting and novel ways to analyze the data, but then communicating them and collaborating with, with diverse groups so that you can make an impact. So to me, it's about data, it's about people, and it's about tools, all those things together are what I call GIS, it's, it's pretty broad. Um, and I thought I'd give you a flavor of some of the stuff that I do. Um, again, this is just a, um, a snippet and the, there's lots more um, projects, but right now increasingly, or at least pre-COVID, we were involved in a lot of projects using UAVs or drones to do vegetation management. We've done work in oak woodlands, we've done work in agricultural settings, um, and in um, other uh, natural settings, the one on the lower left is a de desert environment, vineyards on the right and an oak woodlands um, on the top left. Um, we've got some really interesting work looking at plant water, how plants and leaves use water and what that means for how they reflect um, light through a growing season or even through the day. So we're, we're doing this at very fine scale using UAVs. We've done some neat work um, with machine learning, trying to pull out individual features like trees and understand the uh, characteristics of that tree, how healthy it is, um, how it's growing through the growing season. And we do this with repeated surveys with UAVs. And then the bottom one, um, we're all thinking about fire right now, obviously. 
and um, we've been reflying uh, the river fire site up in Mendocino County that up until this year was the largest, the Mendocino complex was the largest fire in California uh, before 2020 hit. And this next slide follows on, this shows you how, you know, my idea of GIS involves remote sensing. So this shows you a, a suite of remotely sensed images from left to right, from coarse resolution to fine resolution. The top panel is pre-fire, the bottom panel is post-fire. They're coded so that red means healthy vegetation. So you can see how we can get increasingly finer and finer detail. And when you fly with drones, you're really getting specific, how does an individual tree burn? And so we can think about how monitoring how that individual tree might recover post fire. Um, so if you're at all interested in this kind of stuff, remote sensing is so fantastic. And I'm gonna show you some options at the end. Um, for um, folks who are teaching remote sensing classes, but Landsat, Planet, Drone. Um, then um, I thought, you know, we were talking about remote sensing here. Again, I pull all of this into GIS. This is just a snapshot from the new iPad. And if you have read the news about it, it comes with a LIDAR scanner, which is an active remote sensing um, technology. It's sending out um, light and collecting that light back after it bounces off of an object. And so it can tell really in a real detail how far away, in this case, your iPad is from say a chair or a person that you're taking a picture of and, it, and they do it to help resolve that picture. I use LiDAR, not on my iPad, but on an airplane or a UAV or a drone to fly over forests and try to understand something about the, the forest density. What's the structure of the forest in 3D? And so this picture here is just um, an example of a point cloud. Each one of those little dots is a piece of data that tells, the, uh, tells us how far, how far above ground that little piece is and the X, the Y, and the Z. And collectively, when you pool all those individual points together, you can measure information about how um, the individual tree, how dense the forest is. You can add, add these to fire models to think about how fire might move through the forest, or you can think about how an animal might move through the forest. This is really a game changer for how we understand vegetation structure. This is another example of a point cloud this is a, um, a stand, um, a forest in the Sierra, and all of those little scratch marks um, that you see, those lines are not artifacts or anything. Those are actually logs on the forest floor. So this, this, this LIDAR technology can penetrate through the forest and pick up features on the ground. It's really been revolutionary um, in terms of, of mapping forest structure. And just one more um, shot on LIDAR. So, this just shows a forest stand um, on the left. And the idea is um, we're now allowed to, I mean, able to pull out these collections of points as individual trees and take detailed measurements, their height, their size, where they are. And then we can look at the, the structure of the forest, the density, the spacing, the pattern, all this matters, like I said, for water, for fire, for wildlife, just for the way the, the forest is, is structured. So um, a couple of examples there of um, some of my remote sensing GIS work. Oh, and you can put the, the LiDAR, uh, we also mount it on backpacks and walk through stuff. So that's fun. This is a, again, that um, project looking at almonds this is an almond orchard in the Central Valley. And so this uh, John Trebini, a, a colleague of ours, he walks through with this backpack and we're able to pull out this really dense um, point cloud and, and understand a lot about these individual trees. Very cool stuff. Um, one resource for you on campus um, that would be just in Mulford if we were all in Mulford is the GIF. I hope a lot of you know about the GIF already. Um, we're all virtual now. We have a series of workshops. I just took this screenshot here. If you're interested in GIS, but you don't want to take a full semester or you've already taken a full semester class and you just want some touch-ups, the GIF has a lot of um, short workshops, afternoon workshops 
that delve into a particular um, topic. Here's a couple that we did in October, open source with QGIS, remote source, remote sensing with open source tools. And uh, last week the, with some collaborators from, from Mapbox, how to make a, how to use Mapbox to make a, um, a web map. So if you're not familiar with the GIF, please check it out, get on the listserv. There's a lot of really great resources um, for you there. One of the things the GIF does is builds this tool, this website called Cal Adapt, which provides climate change data for California. If you're at all interested in climate change, you wanna explore the tools that they provide with some really lovely visualization, but you can also download those tools and you download the data and use it um, in your own projects. And if you're thinking, how would I do that? I'm not really sure how I would do that. I've got a workshop for you. So coming up in November, there's a CalAdapt um, data workshop using uh, show, showcasing two new packages, one in R and one in Python. These are sort of um, intermediary steps to help you interact with that climate data really seamlessly. If you're interested in this, I'll put the registration link in the chat um, box when I'm done. We'd love to have you um, be part of this. Um, so undergrad opportunities in my lab, I do right now have a SPUR project that's going on. It, we're collaborating with a wonderful group based out of Southern California called Mapping Black California. And their goal is to tell stories about black uh, communities, black families, black people through maps. And so we're collaborating with them um, through a SPUR project, um, looking at percentages of municipal funding that go to police departments in California. And it's just been a real eye-opening and very rewarding um, project. And we'll put on, put in another spur um, for the spring. So um, just, you know, pay attention to spurs and UWRAPs. Those are great opportunities for, um, for GIS. And then finally, I'll close with this. There's some wonderful researchers on campus doing uh, GIS remote sensing. If you're interested in, in finding classes, do searches on these people. Um, Jeff Chambers and Clancy Wilmot. Clancy is brand new in geography. She's a terrific new young scholar who does a lot of work in uh, cartography and, cr and critical GIS. She's really on the social science um, realm of things, just a really fascinating uh, researcher. On the ESPM side, Irena Dranova, Van Butzik, and Manuela Giroto, those are our GIS remote sensing um, core. And Van leads is the faculty signer, signatory on all of the GIS minor paperwork. So if you're in the GIS minor, you're gonna get to know Van. So I'll close there. Um, and unless, are we taking any questions right now or are we just gonna move on? I think we're going to try to keep all of our questions at the end. Great. Um, okay. But yeah, I, thank you so much. You got it. Stop, I've stopped, shared, so I'm queuing up the next person. Okay. Um, thank you so much. I know there'd be a big applause if we we're all in person. That was awesome. Um, and so next up is Dr. Potts. Hello, everybody. Let me get my slide up. My slide starting to share, and then I'll introduce myself more formally. Um, happens when I do slideshow. So I'm a professor in ESPM um, of forest management. I also hold uh, affiliation with the Blum Center for Developing Economies. My research is really on the quantitative management of tropical and temperate forests, a very, very diverse lab, very interdisciplinary. So to sort of give you a flavor of some of my research, I'm going to talk about um, the public's willingness to pay for biodiversity conservation. This was a work I did within collaboration with um, environmental economists a few years ago, thinking about how much individuals might be willing to pay to conserve biodiversity in Malaysia. And more broadly, my lab is interested, as I've said, in these quantitative management issues, which spans tropical and temperate ecosystems, managing and planning of um, of multi-use um, landscapes. So thinking about biodiversity, thinking about carbon, thinking about water. Also spend a lot of time thinking about integrated food, energy, and water systems. So I recommend checking out the web, lab website to see what all my students and I am currently up to. So let me dive into my 
students. My talk, I really like to show this picture. Some of you have taken classes from me, may have seen it before. This is a temperate uh, tropical rainforest in Northern Peninsula, Malaysia, right on the Thai um, Malaysian border. It's about two to 300,000 hectares in total when you count the Thai area. It's one of the most undisturbed parts of Peninsular Malaysia or that part of Southeast Asia I've ever seen. It has a very interesting sort of history. It was a site of a communist insurgency in the 50s and 60s around the same time as Vietnam in the Vietnam War. And so what the Malaysia, the British did, it was, it, it was called, Malaysia was a British colony is they moved a lot of people out of the countryside and into the villages. So this area was sort of depopulated sort of in some sense. And even after the fact, it was sort of a, still a very remote area in the sense of the roads were closed at night up until the eighties, even well past it, just because it was very dangerous to drive these roads. I've been on these roads and see elephants. I've seen tiger footprints, fortunately never seen a tiger. So this is a really intact tropical rainforest. And what we were after in this study is understanding how people who live in sort of rapidly urbanizing Southern parts of Malaysia were interested in pain to protect this forest. And there's two things we're gonna be thinking about when we're thinking about protecting this forest. One is sort of the willingness to pay to sort of protect biodiversity um, in the large sense, all the insects, all the birds, all the mammals, all the plants, all the fungi, all the things we can and cannot see. And then the other side, sort of what happens if we just protect this area from poachers? So we might want to get the economic, you know, production from logging out of this forest, but we want to keep the poachers out to, to keep the charismatic species intact. So this is actually some pictures from, I think, in Sumatra from another one of my students, Matthew Luskin, who was doing a camera trapping study. So you can see he caught this beautiful picture of a tiger in February of 2014. And then a, a little bit late, a little bit earlier in January of 2014, he also caught this person walking through um, the forest with a parong. But I wouldn't necessarily, that's just what you would carry to get through the forest. So I wouldn't necessarily think there may be anything on, ominous going on. And so when we think about how we value something, we first have to think about what we're determining to value. And for some things, it's very easy because there's prices, you can go to the store, you can look online, you can look at the stock market and you can find out what society does to value those goods. And so those are marketed goods. Electricity obviously has a rate, it's set, you know, it's regulated, you have a meter, you go look it up, similar for water. But there are many things we do that when we interact with nature that are not marked, that there aren't an easy way to see, see a price one of them is sort of outdoor recreation where we you know, go out into nature, maybe we pay a park admission fee, but there's all these other things we get these sort of, um, in, we get these um, sort of non things you can't easily measure and put a value on. So how do we begin to measure non-marketed use? And broadly, there are two ways to determine value you know, of non-market goods. One is the use value. So you actually, which is, called, which is also known as revealed preference. You actually go out and watch what people do and you record all the costs that go into doing that fishing, all the fishing gear you buy, how much you pay for a fishing license, how much gas you use when you drive to fish, similar things for beach visits. And in some ways you can implicitly estimate how much people value nature or value that particular activity based on observations. But there are things that such as where you have no observed action. So you sort of donate to WWF, you donate to the Nature Conservancy to protect some sort of forest, some sort of natural system far, far from where you live. And for those systems, there's no way to observe anything because the only thing you're observing is you writing a check, paying online with a credit card or putting something in the mail. And so what you need to do is actually do a survey. And this is called um, stated preference. So you do a survey, it's much like polling, and you basically ask, how much would you be willing to pay for this? And a great example, of, um, a great dear colleague who passed away a few years ago, Peter Burke, he would say, think about, I don't know if anybody's from Florida, if you've been to Key West, you're at the um, Hemingway's famous bar, having, let's, having a drink, and you say, it's, it's winter, it's really nice in, in, in South Florida, but you really like wolves in Yellowstone. And so you're willing to donate to a, a charity that helps preserve the wolves, but there's no way to observe your use of the enjoyment of, of going and seeing the wolves because you don't go there. So we just have to ask you. And of course, when you can ask, you can lie. So let's take this framework and, uh, and apply it to 
Peninsular Malaysia. So here we are, here's Singapore, we're going north. This is Sumatra. So we're gonna look at Greater Selangor, which is, the, here's the, uh, the dot represents um, Kuala Lumpur, the largest city in Malaysia. And we're gonna think about this Balum, Telem, um, Balum Telem, Temengor complex, which was the picture I showed you um, at the beginning, this really intact, fully with a full flora and fauna. And we're gonna ask people in this area how much they're willing to pay for biodiversity. So as I've said, it's the largest tract of virgin forest. At Independence, the Malaysians decided to convert the lowland forest to agriculture. It's threatened by poaching and logging. Those are realities in many parts of the tropics. And we're out to estimate the passive use value of this forest. So I've said we're using stated preference, which I introduced as thinking about how much you would, would be willing to pay, say, wolves to save to pay to save wolves in Yellowstone. And what we're going to do this is create a choice set. We're going to give people basically a menu of options. I'll show you this menu. And then we're going to ask different people how much they're willing to pay. This is a very well grounded uh, approach. Some people will criticize it because, of course, you're asking people what they would do rather than observing what they have do do, but it's used in US law in the Clean Water Act to estimate um, benefits and damages. And likewise for the Exxon Valdez oil spill, which was a major oil spill in Alaska a number of decades ago, this was used many, many times. The beauty, I don't know, not the beauty, but the fact that it was a litigated or contested in court meant many similar stated preference valuation surveys were done over and over again to really understand how how framing the question, who you asked, how you asked it affected the values you got back. So I, well, it's almost dinner time. We're all here for dinner time. So maybe I'll make people a little bit hungry. I really love Malaysian food. So to understand how these choice sets work, what is the menu or what you're gonna choose and how much you're willing to pay. Let's look at um, three menus, three fixed price menus from Malaysia, possibilities you might find at a restaurant. So when I use the terminology choice set, this means the entire set of menus. There's three alternatives. You're gonna either pick menu one, menu two, or menu three. There's different attributes, what your appetizer is, your main course, your dessert, and the actual price. And you can see you can vary the levels within an attribute. For example, the price varies between 63 and 70 ringgit. The beauty of the, of the method if properly done and applied is you can determine diner, an individual diner or an individual person's willingness to pay for each dish rather than the whole menu set by asking a large number of people, but each, giving each individual a small number of choices to make. So they're not gonna get the full choice set, they're gonna get three or four, they would fatigue and probably not perform well versus the hundred that may exist. <clears throat> so for this, we gave them four different choice sets, three alternatives, one, and the alternatives were these different fixed price menus were different types of forest management. The first was how much area was protected from logging. This will reduce sort of, this will prevent biodiversity loss, you know, in the large sense. We also asked how much area would be protected against poaching because logging per se is not going to cause charismatic animals to disappear. It's more the, the hunting and the poaching that comes after the logging. And then we incorporated jobs because obviously logging creates jobs. And so we have to sort of trade that off. And the cost was tied in, in a mental sense for everybody in the sense of their water bill. And there were 81 possible choice sets. Here's what they looked like. Everybody always had no protection that cost um, a certain amount. You could see the jobs created, the number of floods, the cost at the bottom. And then you would have the choice between policy A and policy B and you'd have to choose the one that you preferred. So the survey, we did this in collaboration with the, um, the Malaysian government, the Forest Research Institute in Malaysia. It was done, translated into English, uh, sorry, Tamil, um, Malay, and Chinese. We had um, locals do the survey, so we weren't actually going to the doors. You can see what um, the, the instructions, uh, they were read at the beginning. And we were able to take, take advantage of the fact that Malaysia has a very good census, very much like the US has census tracts. So we could pick a stratified random sample that re well represented um, the, the diverse population of Malaysia. We sort of went through an urban rural transect into the ruler parts. Still, you know, you're close to, a, you're not really remote because you have electricity, you have access to a water, you have a water bill 
but in the same sense, not, you know, not in a downtown urban center. And so before, I don't know how we're gonna do this because I always, I'm out of, I'm not teaching this semester, so I didn't have the poll set up. So I want you to think for a second, which group you would be willing to pay more to protect, the animals impacted by poaching or the animals impacted by logging? And then think in your mind, which group do you think the Malaysian public were, would be more willing to pay to protect? So I'll pause for just a little bit second so you can formulate your answers in your mind. And so here, here was the result. So I think we went in, and I think this is the bias we may brought in, thinking the poaching was more important. You see on, you know, on the WWF, um, you know, logo, pandas, tigers, that people really care about charismatic species. And that d drives biodiversity giving and biodiversity conservation. And you can see actually individual citizens were uh, willing to pay more for logging protection as opposed to poaching protection. We also put in this premium of maximum protection. You get both the logging and the um, poaching protection and then the cost of actually creating jobs or offsetting the job loss. So these, not, these are numbers, a dollar per month. What does that mean? To understand what that means, you have to bring a little bit more of the economics in and do what's called a cost benefit analysis. So we looked at the benefits in the top you know, three lines in terms of the willingness to pay to protect against logging. So 70 million US dollars against logging, 46 against poaching, the additional 14 million to protect against both. And then you look at the costs. And so you got to, in Malaysia as in many, well, not completely in the US that the forest estate is owned by the federal government and timber concessions or short leases are given out for people to log it. So the government doesn't actually get all the revenue from the timber, that it just gets the tax revenue from the timber. So what this is, is not the all overall total value of the timber, it's more the tax revenue from the timber, but they're, they're protecting a public good. There's the direct costs of protection, as well as, as compensating for job loss. And really the take home message from this is, people in Malaysia are willing to pay twice as much as the monetary benefit you get from logging from this area. So this really indicates that there's this strong desire, which we've seen in you know, upper income countries for a long time, starting to permeate lower and middle income countries. And if we look at this, if you look at both the area of primary forest remaining at, by different income groups and lower income, lower middle income, in upper middle income countries, you can see there's a lot of forest in countries like Malaysia that are upper middle income, as well as a lot of threatened endemic animals, birds, and plants. So it really demonstrates that tropical countries are, are willing to pay for their own conservation. And I think, you know, where does this sit up with where my lab's going? So right now we're thinking about many things. We continue to think about biodiversity. I'm also very interested in natural climate solutions in terms of how do we store carbon in soils and forests. And in terms of research opportunities, much like Maggie said, I often have a number of SPUR projects. I have a number of URAP projects. Those are the best ways to sort of get in contact and um, see what my lab's up to. So please be on the lookout for those in the, in the spring. We're right now doing a bunch of stuff on sort of looking at different ways to mitigate climate, climate change by storing carbon in forests. And I will stop here and thank everybody and look forward to questions in a bit. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Blackman. I think I need to stop sharing, maybe, which I'm failing at. Can he? There should be a bar with stop share. At the oh, there, bottom. yeah, oh, there it is. It's obvious. It's black, Brad. I'm telling you, I'm out of practice. There we go. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, oh, let me do one thing. So I can do this. All right. Are we good? Can you all hear me and then see my slide? Yes. All yes. good. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. And it's great to have the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, I'm Ben Blackman. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology. 
And I'm going to start with this collage that illustrates the abundant diversity and complexity we see in plant traits in nature. And I do so uh, to make two points. First to say that my major interest is uh, in the genetics and ecology of this variation. In other words, my lab tries to understand where does this diversity come from uh, in terms of the underlying molecular differences that give rise to the uh, great diversity that we see. And then how does this diversity adapt plants to their environments? How does it serve uh, ecological functions that allow plants to radiate into the many niches that they inhabit? Um, the second point that I wanna make with this is that all of this amazing diversity can be explained by uh, one of three things. Either there are genetic differences among individuals or populations giving rise to the variability we see. Uh, two, there can be differences in the environments that organisms experience over their lifetimes that lead to differences as, as uh, adult plants. Or there can be a combination of these two things and that different genotypes may respond differently to the same environmental signals. And in my lab, we study all three of these mechanisms. So in terms of the major questions that we look at in my lab, we're interested in uh, how organisms respond to the environment during development and particularly in how they integrate predictable daily or environmental, uh, sorry, daily or seasonal cycles in the environment with their own internal rhythms to time their development to the right time of day or year. We then also ask how and why these responses evolve as populations adapt to different environments across the landscapes. And more generally, we're also just really interested in where new trait variation comes from. And we study that in the context of domestication in sunflowers, as well as in the context of nectar guides in monkey flowers. And sunflowers and monkey flowers are the main uh, model systems we use in our lab to study phenotypic diversity, its genetic basis, uh, and its ecological function. Today I'm just going to tell you about one of these stories, and it focuses on that first question, uh, how do organisms integrate environmental signals with their internal rhythms to trigger developmental decisions? And I'll tell you about work we've done on solar tracking in sunflower and how that has informed a project that we're working on now, thinking about uh, how sunflower disks develop uh, in the context of daily rhythms. All right, so uh, many traits exhibit daily or diurnal rhythms, and that's because every 24 hours there's major changes in the abundance of light, warmth, uh, and moisture. And to cope with those fluctuations, organisms often time their growth or physiological activities to occur at particular times of day. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with your own daily or diurnal rhythms. And if there's any truth to this diagram I just pulled off the UNC Fuller School of Pharmacy's website, we're right now in that area where everybody's getting toward their highest blood pressure. So hopefully a bunch of pretty plant pictures are helping you calm down a little bit. Uh, plants have daily rhythms as well, uh, both in terms of how their stems grow, when their flowers open and close in many species, and when they uh, release chemicals uh, to interact with other organisms in their environments like herbivores and predators or with pollinators. And so this variability that we see that these changes that happen every day raise several fundamental questions. How are these diurnal rhythms regulated by environmental cues and plants internal rhythms? How do they allow organisms to fit their environment and this changing environment they experience every 24 hours to promote their survival and reproduction. And when we see variation across individuals or populations or species, when do we see it and why did that evolve? So we've been answering these questions uh, initially in the context of solar tracking or diaheliotropism in the common sunflower Helianthus annuus. Sunflowers face east, at dawn and over the course of the day, the stem grows and bends so that the apex faces west at dusk and at night they reorient back to face east again in anticipation of dawn. Uh, and there's a lot of really fascinating aspects of this uh, behavior, but one of them is that uh, all of this is being driven by irreversible uh, cell expansion on either side of the stem asymmetrically at different times of day. So if you put landmarks just with a marker on a sunflower stem on the east and west side and you follow how much the stem expands between those markers. What you see is that on the east side of the stem you have greater growth during the daytime than during the evening. 
Uh, and the opposite is true on the west side of the stem. So the west side grows faster at night than during the day. And thus there are these periods of differential growth that lead to the westward bending during the uh, day and the eastward bending at night. Um, sunflowers do this uh, from the time they're young seedlings up until they bloom. As they approach the time the flowers open, they bend less and less west each day such that they end up facing a fixed eastward orientation um, at maturity. Uh, now this is a trait that you know has fascinated humans for a very long time. It's what sunflowers are actually named for. Uh, sunflower in uh, French is girasol in uh, or sorry, in Spanish is girasol and French is tournesol, both of which means to turn with the sun. Um, but despite you know, this being a trademark behavior of sunflowers, we actually know very little about its regulation. Uh, and so with collaborators at Davis, we set out to ask what are the cues that drive solar tracking and the proximate mechanisms that integrate them? How variable is it? And can we use that to map the underlying genes responsible for the trait? And then finally, is there a benefit to tracking or facing east at maturity? So in terms of the first question, the cues, it's clear that uh, moving direction of incident light is required. So if you grow plants in the growth chamber or greenhouse, they grow straight up. Um, uh, and it's also sufficient to drive this. So uh, postdoc in our collaborators lab did an experiment with an arc of lights uh, in a setup where the lights would turn on sequentially to mimic the movement of the sun. And when he was able to do so, uh, the plants recapitulated the behavior. They faced the putative east lamp in the morning uh, and over the course of the day moved to face the west lamp. But what about that nocturnal reorientation? The plants uh, don't have an equivalent light source that moves across the sky from west to east at night. And so we hypothesize that the circadian clock, this internal uh, timekeeper that all organisms have that works on a 24 hour cycle that in order to gauge or synchronize key activities so they happen at times of day uh, that are beneficial to a plant, um, we hypothesized that that could be involved. And so to test that, we did an experiment again using that arc of light growth chamber because under a total day night cycle of 24 hours, we can recapitulate the nocturnal reorientation from west fast to east. But notably, if you extend that total day-night cycle to 32 hours, so it's off of the period of the circadian clock, you still see the daytime tracking from the east west lamp to the west lamp, but then there's no nocturnal reorientation back from west to east. And notably, if you keep following those same plants and just change the light cycle in the growth chamber back to 24 hours, what you find is that in just a few days, that nocturnal reorientation is reestablished. And so because there's this sweet spot of, spot of 24 hours, it really implicates the clock as being involved. And so solar tracking then is a really nice paradigm to study how internal rhythms from the clock and external signals from uh, cycling light conditions are coordinate a complex pattern of growth to lead to this interesting behavior. So how can we understand what those cues are doing and how they're coordinating this uh, at the cellular level? Well, one way we can do this is to use genetics and look at natural variation that exists within sunflower for this trait and map the underlying mutations responsible for that variation. Um, we've done so using genetic mapping panels that either we've developed or the sunflower community has developed where all of the, where for instance, here, this is a panel of about 280 sunflower lines, all of which are fully resequenced. And so any trait that we score on this panel, we can then connect to the underlying genetic variation. Um, and so this is what we've done for solar track and we grow plants up in buckets in the field so we can then move them to matte black backdrops, film them with time-lapse cameras to generate the videos like the one I showed you. We then go through these videos and score them individually for traits like when the plants start moving from west to east relative to dawn or when they start moving back relative to dusk. And because it's time-lapse photography, of course, we capture a bunch of interesting other phenotypes as well. What does this data look like? Well, we, let's say we're scoring when plants start moving back to, from west to east relative to dusk. What we see is on average plants start moving back right around dusk, but there's a lot of variability. And if we look among lines, you can see some lines start moving back over an hour earlier than dusk and others over an hour later. And so we can take this phenotype data, pair it with the genotype information from sequencing the genomes of all of these lines. And when we do that, we get 
plots that look like this. Um, every dot is a different um, segregating variant in the, on this panel in the sunflower genome across the 17 chromosomes of sunflower. And on the y-axis, how high that dot rises is how strong there is an association between whether uh, an individual, say, has an adenine or a thymine at that particular nucleotide and how they um, behave in terms of how early or late relative to dawn or dusk they uh, change direction. And so uh, underneath these peaks, there are you know, just a handful of genes, um, many of which are interesting and to further understand which ones are most interesting, um, we then also pair this with gene expression studies where we use a vegetable peeler to peel off the east and west facing sides of the stem and then extract RNA from that and do this over a daily cycle to see if there are any differences. And for instance, under this peak here, there is a gene involved in auxin, which is a major plant growth hormone um, involved in auxin signaling um, that shows uh, differential expression between the east and west side of the stem, making it a really good candidate to follow up. Okay, so we can use genetics to identify the underlying basis of this. Um, we've also been doing ecological experiments to try to understand why plants track and why they face east. I'm just gonna tell you quickly about the latter question. And this, we just did a simple experiment. We grew plants up in the field, uh, left some facing east when they bloomed and others like these we turned to face west away from the rising sun here and asked what was different. Um, one of the things that is not surprisingly different is that east facing plants warm up more quickly than west facing plants because they're getting that direct irradiation from the rising sun. Um, but in terms of how that impacts uh, a plant's performance, what we found uh, across multiple years, multiple field sites and multiple trials was that east facing plants attract more pollinator visitation early in the morning than the west facing plants. Um, and temperature is really what's responsible for this because if we warm up west facing plants with a radiant heater like you might sit under on a restaurant patio that we can tune because it's on a propane tank. To, and so we warm these up to match the east facing plants. What we find is that if we add heat back to the west facing plants, we recover a gap, the gap in pollinator visitation. All right, so um, overall then for this, what I've told you is that there's uh, directional light signaling and that change over the course of the day drives the westward daytime tracking. Nocturnal reorientation is involved with the circadian clock. We can use the diversity within species to map the underlying genetic basis that governs that coordination and that uh, facing east enhances sunflower reproduction. And in doing that experiment to look at the impact of facing east, um, one of the things that we noticed and one of the reasons we think that uh, um, what east facing plants attract more pollination early in the morning is because the temperature difference affects how the florets mature. And this has gotten us into studying floret maturation as another phenotype that integrates information from the circadian clock and the environment. So if you think about an individual sunflower for floret, it matures over the course of a couple days. First, the bud opens, the anther tube extends, and the style pushes the pollen out of the top of the tube by the morning of day one. So that's its in staminate phase. It's ready to give its pollen to a pollinator to go pollinate something else. Then the style continues to elongate out of the anther tube in the two lobes of the stigma unfurl, and now it's in pistillate phase, ready to receive pollen um, and have its ovules fertilized. And notably, all of the florets, as you can see in this picture, that are in the several rings of the sunflower disk that enter maturation at the same time, they're doing this synchronously, suggesting involvement of the circadian clock. And indeed, if you move sunflowers into constant dark conditions, they'll maintain a periodicity in these rhythms, indicating clock involvement. However, we also know from our east versus west facing experiments that east facing plants put out their pollen earlier in the morning than west facing plants by about an hour to two hours. And um, temperature is responsible because if we warm up the west facing plants, again, we restore some of that difference. So again, we have a system where we have an interface between a cycling environmental condition, in this case temperature, and, a, and the clock regulating a complex developmental phenotype. And we want to understand how that's coordinated. So how do we do that? We use the same methods that we use for solar tracking. We can grow 
a whole bunch of sunflowers in the field, again, using this mapping panel, film them with time-lapse imagery so that we can capture when during the day they're putting out their pollen or stigmas. Um, and we do this both facing east and facing west. So we can look at that environmental se sensitivity as a trait in its own right. And we generate uh, thousands of videos that look like this, where you see the blooming sunflower, the, at dawn the buds break open, the anther tube extends and the pollen is put out. And then much later, the styles fully elongate and the stigmas open. And so what we're doing now is we're sc scoring all of these videos for these timing traits. And many undergraduates uh, through SPUR or URAP have been involved with this so that we can then do the association mapping and see what's happening. The other thing you'll notice in this video is that we can see when various insects and pollinators come and visit the plants. And another thing we hope to map is, you know, which pollinators visit when during the day, does a plant's genotype matter um, in that? And so that we can map the genetic basis of pollinator uh, attraction in the sunflowers as well. And both of these, I think, will help us understand better what are genetic variants that breeders can use to improve cross-pollination in sunflowers? And then also because this involves elongation of the style and the anthers, um, uh, also uh, how it affects self-pollination as well. With that, um, I'll just thank many folks in the lab, especially the many undergraduates who hauled buckets back and forth and have scored so many videos over time for us to lead us to some really interesting conclusions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Bachman, for that incredible presentation. Uh, yeah, feel free to send the applause emojis and everything. Um, our last presentation before we open it up to the Q&A section will be from Dr. Napoli. The time is yours. Set up <clears throat> shared screen here. What's going on? Uh, OK. Can you see this? Um, yep, we can see it. Okay, but I what happened? Slideshow from the beginning. Okay, that Perfect. should. There we go. Okay, so I, I'm going to talk about one of the things that retinoic acid does. Um, it, it's actually complex. One thing that's adiposity and fat deposition and endurance, but it does many things. And let's see if we can't. Um, my slide thing isn't moving, huh? Why is it not? I think if you left click on the slide, it should go to the next one. Okay, uh, left click. There we go. Okay, yeah, it, the regular buttons weren't working. Okay, so vitamin A is retinol, but it's not uh, active. Okay, it has to be converted into retinal, and that supports vision. And then the, the many tissues, including the epithelial of the eye, have another set of enzymes which make all transretinoic acid. So most of your vitamin A is used for vision. A very quantitatively small amount is converted into retinoic acid. And this compound is a hormone that controls stem cell differentiation and uh, the development of cells and the, um, the function of differentiated cells. So if we look down here, it's just a list of all of the things needed uh, that retinoic, not all, but that uh, retinoic acid supports and it's, you know, it includes reproduction, dermal regulation, the development of the embryo. And what I'm gonna talk about is adiposity and energy balance. And so these two enzymes, RDHs and RALDHs, aren't just one each. There are multiple enzymes here for multiple RDHs and multiple RALDHs. So it's a very complex process. So I'm going to talk about one RDH. And we've knocked out several, and we've knocked out RALDHs and other uh, uh, proteins with respect to the, the uh, maintenance of retinoic acid to find out what is their function. So I'm going to talk about RDH10 today. Let's see if that works. Okay, so 
just just gives you an idea of how retinoic acid is used um, therapeutically, right? Retin-A, it's retinoin, and here is retinol uh, in cream. They charge you an awful lot for stuff that I get much cheaper. Okay, so systemically, um, there's isotretinoin, also known as Accutane, and it is a cure for acute cystic acne, not a treatment. Uh, once the disease goes away, it stays that way, which is really weird because most drugs are treatments. Um, but the problem with uh, this is that systemic retinoids are highly toxic to embryos, and they've uh, caused up to 84% incidence of birth defects. So you have to be very careful with Accutane. Okay, so what's the relationship between retinoic acid and energy balance? Well, gluconeogenesis is a process where you convert your muscles into glucose when you're not eating, and lipolysis is the mobilization of fat to, to, um, so that you can burn the fat for energy. This is, these two are stopped by insulin, which is released in the fed state. So you don't need to make glucose or or um, mobilize fat when you're fed. Conversely, when you're fasting, glucagon is secreted and it promotes uh, making new glucose and releasing fat for burning. If you look at retinoic acid, it does the same thing as glucagon, okay? So it stimulates gluconeogenesis and lipolysis. Now, insulin inhibits RDH10, which causes retinoic acid to decrease and it also stimulates an enzyme that degrades retinoic acid. So when you're in the fed state, your retinoic acid concentrations go down. And when you're in the fasted state, the retinoic acid concentrations go up. So retinoic acid responds to your energy balance. So I'm gonna talk about knockouts now. Uh, the control mice are called wild type. And I'm gonna talk about a heterologous knockout. That means only one allele of RDH10 has been uh, neutralized. And the reason is if you neutralize both of them, the animal dies. And so this results in a very modest decrease in retinoic acid, which is good because then we can get to see what does it really do. And what we found is not only if you knock down this one allele, uh, you get about a 25% decrease in retinoic acid, but the mouse gets fat in muscle, liver, bone, brown adipose, and white adipose are all affected. They all become dysfunctional. And we're going to show you some examples of that. So here are, here's the mouse to knock out. Um, they're on the average about five grams heavier, which is about 13%. So if you think about that, if you weigh 100 pounds, if, you, if you only one allele of RDH10 is knocked out, you're going to gain 13 pounds. And this is early in life. So the curve here of the head is continually to go up while the wild type is flattening out. Okay, So they're gaining weight, and that weight is fat, not lean. So you can show that the lean is over here. OK, so now what does this do to the organs? Well, in this case, let's go organ. So this is a white adipose tissue, okay? Lower abdominal. Look at the size of the cells. They're huge. Um, wild type is much smaller cells. So what's happening is your white fat is blowing up. It's increasing in uh, fat. And the reason is it's not mobilizing the fat um, to generate energy. So when retinoic acid decreases even modestly, you are unable to mobilize fat efficiently. And so you become fat and have low energy. Um, if we look at liver, now look at the, the, the knockout liver. It's almost twice the size. And if you look over here, these red dots are all fat. So the liver is accumulating fat. These white spaces are basically holes that um, are, due, are there due to damage. And so this is um, 2.1 fold increase in fat, okay? And this disease is referred to as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, okay? Or NAFLID. 
And this is a precursor to non-alcoholic steel uh, steatohepatitis, which leads to inflammation and liver cancer. So, and this work was done by an undergraduate, by the way. So um, if we go through bone, uh, this is female bone. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say is the liver occurs only in male and the bone phenotype occurs only in female. So we have our first uh, demonstration of retinoic acid regulating fat uh, accumulation in a sexually dimorphic manner, right? So this is, these white dots here are fat coming out from the growth plate where the um, stem cells are. And you see here a different growth shape of growth plate and no fat. So a threefold increase in fat in the femur, females only. And this is a precursor to osteoporosis. Okay, so um, we're getting to, yeah, here is, sorry, I gotta go back. Can I go back? Previous, yeah. So this is muscle. So this is calf muscle. Notice in the males, the calf muscle is bigger. In the females, there seems to be no, no change. And the increase in these calf muscles is the result of fat, again, triacylglycerol. So uh, 1.7 times more fat in the calf muscles relative to the females. So the point being, you're supposed to be burning that fat for energy, but instead, these animals cannot mobilize fat. And then if we look at the fibers, we see that the fiber type changes. So uh, muscle has different types of fibers. Some burn fat, some burn carbohydrate, and some are mixed. And these animals compensate towards fibers that burn fat in an effort to get rid of this excess fat. Now, again, this is sexually dimorphic. The females and the males are affected differently. So we ask at this point, we, we, one of the things we do is look at mechanism, which I haven't talked about here, okay? Um, just the phenomenon. And then once we see the phenomenon, we then what is the mechanism? So here's another phenomenon. Let's see if I can't, here we go. Oops. Uh oh, it's not going back. Female, okay, previous. So this worked today, but I'm not, it's not working now. Okay, so my point is what, what I wanted to show you here, and I don't know why it's not working. Are they videos? It's a video and it worked uh. when I put it on, um, but what you should see, and I can't get it to go. Uh, and I don't know why, because on, on my uh, slides it worked. But anyway, it's, it's running. And these mice, these are the males, and what you do is you run them to exhaustion. And it turned out that the wild type ran 62 minutes and the het's only 37 minutes. And so what, what you would have seen here is that the wild type mouse keeps running out of the, the uh, range of the video where ultimately the head gets slammed back here and can't move. But here's the thing, when we do this with females, the opposite happens. The wild type run 33 minutes and the head 72 minutes. So here you're seeing the head ahead of the, the wild type. And so what you would have seen had this thing worked and why it does, I don't know, was basically um, how different these animals are when um, uh, in running and many other things. Okay, so don't say, let me get rid of that. So um, that's really what I have to say. M much of the work that you saw there was done by undergraduates. And I've had, oh, not exaggerating, about 50 undergraduates in my lab in the last five years. And uh, some of them do tremendous work. Uh, the bone work was done by Mitch and, uh, many, many others. So a lot of what you saw was undergraduate work. Okay, and it's just, as I said, one of our knockouts. Okay, so that. 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, so now I'm gonna just make a quick um, applause. Woo, oh, thank you so much. Um, and then I'm just gonna make a quick plug for our virtual um, hours for peer advising. So they're every day from 10 to noon and then from two to five. Yes, and you guys can ask us about research. Lots of people um, do different types of research and we all have all different types of majors. And if this event was helpful, we wanna have more events like this that are helpful. So you can email us at pal at berkeley.edu. But now we will get into the Q and A and I think Isaac is gonna bring our first question. Yeah, so um, yeah, we have for getting involved in research. So this can be, this question is open to any of the any of the presenters, uh, and a lot of people are interested in learning not only just how to first get involved if like you have if uh, undergraduates have limited experience in a lab but how that is changing um, with the virtual format that a lot of positions are in right now, including uh, classes and academics. So what are some either examples or tips for undergraduates who uh, don't have as much experience but are interested in getting involved in a virtual or uh, some type of limited in-person format? Uh, I, I can start by fielding this. So in my lab, uh, this term, we have people uh, who've gotten involved in research newly this term, uh, both that are working remotely or that are uh, doing work on campus now that there's capacity to have that happen. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the Sunflower Project is a great example of one that can be worked on virtually because it's a lot of image analysis. And so as long as there's access to the files, you know, you can, help us with the, the students are helping us with the project. Um, things that we do to improve the um, sort of aspect of working in a lab that uh, is not just doing the research and learning the skills, but also being part of the lab group and benefiting from the larger intellectual community in the lab. Um, you know, students are encouraged to come to our lab meetings and we hold those online. And then as a group, um, our lab is also this term um, going to a uh, seminar, uh, whether that's like an integrative biology seminar, plant microbial biology seminar, uh, an innovative genomics institute seminar. We pick one a week that we'll, we can go to as long as, you know, and students, undergraduates attend those with us as long as their classes don't conflict. And then we talk about them afterward. Um, and so uh, there are ways to get involved if you're remote and then um, for the students who are on campus to help us with the many monkey flower plants that we're growing in our other projects, you know, we have set up a shift schedule and um, so that we meet the budget densities um, that are required of us on campus and follow all of the safety guidelines that are required as well. Um, our next question is actually for Dr. Napoli specifically. Um, where do you see the future of your research field going and which classes do you recommend at Cal to prepare for nutrition labs? To prepare for nutrition labs would be NST 103 and NST 160. Um, preparing, uh, where, where is the research going? Uh, what we're trying to do is figure out the mechanisms whereby uh, retinoic acid controls these processes because they're related to diseases such as type 2 diabetes. So for example, that muscle phenotype where the I only showed you the running endurance, but there's a lot of other things that go wrong in the use of glucose and in the use of uh, fat. And insulin resistance or muscle is a primary source of insulin resistance that leads to diabetes. So it's the connection of where, what does retinoic acid do for energy balance, diabetes, and the metabolic syndrome. So we had um, several students ask um, the best way to secure a research position if they have no previous experience. We also have some junior uh, standing students and transfer students that are particularly nervous during this COVID time. So if any of the other professors wanted to talk about 
um, those type of opportunities in their labs specifically or um, other faculty members that they know are also look looking for undergrads. In NST, we're still taking undergraduates. Um, we're restricted, but the restrictions have just been lifted to an extent. And so it depends on the size of your lab, the physical space, how many different rooms you have. And if you exceed that, then the undergraduates are working in shifts. And so the labs have schedules where some people work in the morning, some work in the afternoon, et cetera. So I would say approach whoever Whatever faculty member you're interested in, send them an email, tell them you're interested. They'll usually respond and perhaps grant you an interview. Sorry, I need to unmute myself. Sorry, um, to follow on what Joe said, I think also it's good to reach out to the postdocs and the graduate students in the lab. They're often on the websites too, and they're often looking at people and they, you may feel that they're a little more accessible. They're also very often looking for people and looking to, um, for help as well. And that's a good way to understand the dynamics of a lab. Uh, yeah, usually when a student uh, um, approaches me, I will engage with them and then send them to, send a message to my postdocs and graduates and, and say, is anyone interested in this student? And they'll then interview them and make their decision. So yeah, it's it's a good thing to include them. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I will ask the next question. Um, so I think this is for everyone. Uh, does your research require any data cleaning or programming in order to be eligible? So in my group, we, you know, I, I, I went through a lot of the sort of organismal aspects of things, but clearly we were doing the, uh, you know, with the association mapping, there was some bioinformatics in there as well. And we, we do, um, have uh, projects where uh, computational biology and uh, bioinformatics and programming um, you know, work can be helpful. And those are skills that we have in the lab. And there are some things that require skills we don't have in the lab too. Like the pollinator stuff, we would really like to figure out how to do by machine learning, but that's beyond our expertise. And so uh, at the moment, um, and so, you know, those, skills can be helpful if they you come in and every time I interview somebody um, I just ask you know do you have what's do you have any background in uh, computer programming or uh, bioinformatics or statistics um, and I ask just because you know there are it just opens up different project possibilities that I might consider uh, having a student get involved with um, it doesn't like I it's it's not a prerequisite um, by any means, um, but it just kind of makes me think, oh, I could actually put the student on this project um, instead, and that would be a really good match. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I approach it when I'm looking at it. Um, and, you know, I think that that is definitely another way that uh, if you're working, if you're studying remotely, um, that you can get involved with uh, labs. And I know that there's, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of data these days and a lot of um, uh, data cleaning and uh, analysis to do. Um, and we have several undergrads in my lab that are doing that sort of thing now. I would agree. I think it depends on the project. <clears throat> Some of them are faster if you can code it. And um, so programming is always great. Scripting a problem is, is always better than doing it over and over again. And in the GIS world, you know, you should really get, if you're interested in it, you should get to be pretty proficient in either Python or R and, um, and data cleaning. Yeah, there's a fair amount of that in our, um, in our work. I, I just wanna add like, it's something that it's a skill that if you don't have it, um, the postdocs and grad students in my lab are really excited and engaged in sort of helping to build that. Um, uh, and so like this summer, 
when um, all the undergrads are working remotely, one of my postdocs ran a R club to do an introduction to R and some basic skills in statistical programming. So most of the, the, the so-called data cleaning in my lab is just choosing the right statistical program. And we have programs that draw our figures and they have built-in statistics and tutorials that lead you through them. So you don't need any prior knowledge. And uh, after you do this, then they'll engage with the postdocs or myself to check whether or not it was a, an appropriate use of statistics to come to to make the graph, et cetera, so. Yeah, I would concur with what everybody said so far that it, you know, it's, it's, for me, it's very project dependent. It'll depend sometimes it's, you know, handling sealed samples, weighing them, doing things that don't require a lot of, you know, data analytics, but other times it is, does involve programming data analytics. And so it's really is problem specific. So there, and, but in general, beginning to think about learning those skills is sort of important as you go through your undergraduate career, because over, you know, sciences are just more and more quantitative, all aspects, it touches everything. All right, one of the other questions that we got was, um, let's see, how did you get involved in your field of research and what are some things that have inspired your research topics? Well, I think most of us have done postdoctoral studies and usually when you're in doing your postdoctoral work, you start to uh, know what you're attracted to and start getting ideas of what you're going to do when you become independent. And so you pick something that basically rings your bells and pursue it when you become an independent scientist. I think for me, I would trace it back to my undergraduate research experiences, um, not necessarily in like doing exactly what I'm doing, but in getting excited about uh, questions in evolutionary biology, biology and the origins of diversity. Um, and you know, there are other interests I had back then as well um, related to anthropology. And so that comes in through my work on domestication. And you know, I've always tried to work in systems and on projects that marry both genetics and field work and ecology, because um, I like to bring that all together. And so over the course of my career, I've tried to keep working on projects that allow me to, to do that, because uh, uh, you know, I enjoy it all. I actually, and I, I, I see this now playing out in the undergraduates who have come through my own lab as well. So I just wrote a, graduate fellowship applic uh, application letter of recommendation for a student who you know, worked in my lab on plant biology, uh, but then went on to do um, some work uh, in a lab uh, working on uh, 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 parasitology, um, bacteriology, and then also um, uh, in a lab that uh, worked on human genetics. And now she's in grad school and she's gonna do this really amazing field project working on interactions between the environment, baboons, bats, disease, and the berries they eat. And it's just like bringing it all together. And so I think, you know, you accumulate uh, interests and skills and questions over your course in science. And, you know, I think often they come back and integrate um, and so it, you know, it all starts now. I mean, as for me, I think it was sort of classes I took and people I met away through my, along my way in my career. I was, you know, I have a math background. And so early on, I was a math major in college. And at some point I took a theoretical ecology course at the University of Michigan. And there was a professor that sort of opened up the door to show me and showed me what I could do with my math with biology. I wasn't somebody who still don't like to memorize things. I've always viewed biology as sort of like a catalog of facts. And there was sort of a way to begin to sort of unite those two things that led me to take a lot of biology courses as an undergraduate, but, you know, a few courses probably will make. And then, you know, grad school was also who my PhD mentor was and just sort of his passion for his particular part of the world he worked in. And sort of once you kind of get, and it sort of led me down a path and you know, I can trace sort of it from that point going forward. 
So I think it's the people you meet along the way can have a big impact on where you end up. Yeah, I'd agree with that. You know, find somebody whose work speaks to you or um, a series of classes that you love and find that you're intrigued in. Um, and if you decide you want to take the research career, talk to people, interview people, find out what what makes what what, what makes them tick. Um, because let's face it, you're not going to make a ton of money. So um, you've got to love it and you've got to find something that, that speaks to you and that you want to dig into for, for the long haul. So all of these, yeah, you just got to find something that sparks something in you. Great. Thank you all. Our next question is for Dr. Kelly, uh, but can be applied to the other the other presenters. And they ask, uh, what advice would you give to students the technologies and programs used in your lab in order to um, get more involved? I'm sorry, Isaac, you broke up halfway through that. Can you just repeat it? Yeah. So the question is, what advice would you give to, to students who don't have as much experience with the technologies and programs that are used in your lab? Oh, yeah. So that's every, yeah, yeah, you got to start somewhere, right? Nobody's um, born knowing ArcGIS Pro or whatever. Um, so if you, I would, I always think, you know, take a, take a GIS class, take SBOM 72. If it, if you like it, if it's, if it, if it's you enjoy doing the labs, if it makes sense to you to see these things in map form, then just explore everything that you've got. Sign up for the minor, take the GIF workshops um, that are available to you, you know, dig in. So everybody starts somewhere. And um, I don't know, I just think there's a particular type of person who having, who for whom, maps are a great organizing concept and they just speak to you. That's me. And so every, if I can think about it in terms of a map form, I understand it. And um, you'll know it when you get it. But if you take an intro to GIS class and you're like, I could not get through it, it drove me crazy, then move on, find something else. <laughs> but everybody starts somewhere. So just bouncing off of that GIS stuff, someone asked if the GIF um, workshops are held frequently. They are, and you can also get like drop-in advising. Yes. This is fast, I'm doing that for my senior thesis. So you guys should totally check them out. Um, and then for a question for Professor Blackman, um, someone <clears throat> asked, how do we know about the molecular mechanisms responsible for the circadian clock in the sunflowers? So, um, we know about them, uh, so right now, um, what we are trying to do, so a lot of what we know about the clock and sunflowers inferred based on, um, what happens in other organisms and how that, um, is conserved across plant diversity. Um, and so there are some things that we can infer from our gene expression data um, that, you know, genes that have very similar sequences to genes in other organisms like Arabidopsis, um, where a lot is known about how the clock functions. Um, you know, if we see them cycling with similar periodicities in sunflower, that's, uh, you know, a good indication that they are likely involved in the clock in sunflower as well. Um, one of the things that uh, is a drawback of sunflower, but we are trying to um, get over this obstacle is sunflower is actually quite difficult um, to do genetic transformation of. And so if we wanna to apply tools like um, CRISPR-Cas9 or other uh, functional um, manipulations to really work out the details of this, we need to improve that. And so we have a collaboration with the IGI to move that forward. Uh, thankfully in monkey flower, the other system we work on in my lab, that is uh, something we readily transform in the lab and um, can you know, do experiments to, to overexpress or knock out genes um, and see 
what happens so we can piece together how these mechanisms are really working at the molecular level. Okay, awesome. Another question we have, and this can be posed to anyone, um, is what would you say is the most rewarding aspect of your research and work? Well, for me, it's when you get a project done and a paper accepted, and you have either postdocs or graduate students as the first authors, and uh, the contributions of undergraduates who have really contributed a great deal to the papers. And like one of the figures is due to one undergraduate who has really done a great job. And so undergraduates are on my papers. And I think that's you know, that's the, the, the completion of a project when you publish a paper and you've, you've done it with the team who has learned and contributed. Yeah, well said, I agree. Yeah, I would, I mean, concur largely. I think it's also sort of the mentorship scene, the undergraduates, the graduate students grow, which are sort of integral to those types of successes that Joe described those interactions, those one-on-one, -on -one, seeing somebody come in and where they end up and grow to. Yeah, I, I'd echo all of that um, and, and just add that, you know, I, that, that satisfaction doesn't end when you leave Berkeley, you know, as I write letters for students and just hear what they've gone on to do, um, you know, it's really satisfying to, to see um, where everybody goes and all their successes as well. All right, so one of our questions was, um, when you um, accept undergrads, are there any key qualifications that you're looking for? Well, I, okay, go ahead. No, I can go. I mean, it does, I mean, I don't think I, I don't think there's anything key quality. I mean, I think there's some basic qualities, responsible, you know, um, dedicated, have some interest and passion. I mean, I think I'm looking, you know, looking for people that want to get engaged. And, and, and beyond that, it'll really depend on this, you know, if there's particular skills a project needs, then it may air that way. But I am, as we talked about earlier, very cognizant that it's hard to get into research early in your Cal career and you have to be a little bit patient in the sense sometimes. And that's why the knocking on doors and people saying no to you is a, is a part of life. We get rejected a lot, all the time in some sense, you know, academia is a lot about saying when you write papers, people saying no, or we don't like that. But I think it's the perseverance there a little bit at the beginning can help. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think in my case, it's, is what Matthew just said. And I'd characterize it as, the, the um, personality and character of the undergraduate where you think this, this person is going to really put in a lot of energy to work and is really serious about doing the work. It's not the skills. Um, no undergraduate has skills. They have to learn them. Um, for me, it's definitely uh, an enthusiasm for the the project and the questions that our our lab is interested in i think you know that that underlying motivation is what gets students through the often very tedious work that we do in like going through and scoring you know hundreds of plants for something or like clicking through a bunch of images to do something you know it's a, it's a lot of time and uh uh tedium um, but the, that excitement about the question is what drives you through to, to see something to the end. And so, you know, seeing that in an interview, um, uh, either through related, uh, you know, things that, um, you know, they, a student refers to that they've learned or um, that they ask questions about my research um, uh, that show they're excited or something I learned, uh, some things that I look for. The other thing uh, is, to be honest, you know, something that is uh, kind of out of everybody's control in that, um, you know, for me, matching students and mentors so that the mentor can train them and is not overloaded with too many mentees and, 
uh, and is available is really important. And so when someone interviews, I ask them to then send me their class schedule and when they think they'll be available. Um, and you know, creating that match with the mentor through scheduling is something that can be uh, determining and whether I can accept the student or not. Um, and uh, because you know that that match is key, no one will have a good experience if the the training um, capacity isn't there. Um, so that's that's just another thing that I'm looking for. That's not a personal reflection. It's just a logistical question. Okay, so I think that's unfortunately all we have time for. So I wanna thank all of the professors for coming. Um, this was really great. And I wanna thank all of you guys for coming. This is awesome. Um, so yeah, please come to our virtual office hours. If you guys ever have any questions about research, you can email us. Um, you heard it here that these professors want you guys to work in their lab, which is so exciting. So cold email, apply. You can apply to three SPURS and three UREPs this spring. And there are opportunities, even though we're in the, like a crazy virtual semester. Okay, so thank you everyone. Thanks for listening. Have a good evening all or good morning depending on where you are. <laughs> all right.